Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Anthony Murnell. Thank you for joining us. This week, we discuss early childhood education and care in New Mexico. Joining us is Executive Director of Engage New Mexico, Lori Martinez. Lori, thank you so much for joining us for the program. Thanks for having me. This is obviously such an important issue in New Mexico. It has been for a really long time. And the pandemic has made an impact to this issue as well. Do we have an understanding about how COVID-19 has impacted early childhood uh, education and care in the state? Um, I think it's safe to say we have some. It's The pandemic isn't over, so the changes aren't, aren't over either. But one area that we do know, I think, more about um, is related to childcare because during the pandemic, childcare providers um, were impacted really heavily, not just in New Mexico, but across the country. And we know that in New Mexico, we lost a lot of childcare providers, not just um, the center-based ones, but in New Mexico, uh, the state allows home childcare providers as well. And so we know that we lost a fair amount of them. We don't know how many more we're gonna lose and the state has been taking um, steps to retain them and to try and and rectify that situation, um, but we don't know long-term yet what the outcomes of that are gonna be. Okay, now what, have, what has the state done to really take action against this issue and help out childcare providers? Uh, well, one thing that's important for people to know if they don't already is that our state launched a statewide early childhood education and care department. Um, we're one of just a handful of states in the country that have a cabinet level state department um, focused on early childhood. And so what that did is it took a lot of our early childhood programs that were previously uh, spread out between the public education department and children with the families department, uh, department of health and moved them under the umbrella of one agency. So what that does is it helps um, streamline services and hopefully in the long term makes them more um, accessible to families. Um, the other thing that's important to remember is that that department launched during the pandemic. And so um, by law, it was um, slated to, you know, to begin on July 1st, but the reality was they were moving before then. And so um, some of the things they did were um, putting uh, lots of subsidies into place right away, for example, and working really hard not to be, I think, punitive towards um, families and providers whose situations changed really rapidly. Because um, if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, only essential providers were, were really working, you know, and the state had a pretty strict definition at first. And so childcare providers were limited to who they could serve at that time too. They could only serve children of essential providers. And so for a lot of um, early childhood um, provider or a lot of childhood providers, they had to um, make really hard decisions about shutting their doors or not. And the state stepped in with subsidies, um, paying differentials, covering parents' co-pays during that time. And so they, they did a number of things to work to make sure that there was still some supports in place for the childcare providers. And then, when the, on the national level, when some relief funds started coming down, um, the state released funds to childcare providers as well. So the most recent large example of that would be um, in September of this year, I believe it was, the state distributed millions of dollars um, under, it was called the Child Care Stabilization Grant. Um, and it was to hundreds of providers in the state, both home and child care providers to help them stay afloat essentially. And they were really, really broad grants. So those providers could use them for just about anything. Yeah, that was around $157 million, I believe the state uh, released um, to the child care industry in the state. Um, from, I'm just going from data from the early childhood uh, care department yeah. um, or that was um, uh, released uh, in the fall. but. I, I want to talk with you. Yes. You served on an advisory council for early childhood education and care uh, in this state. Um, you know, what are the conversations uh, 
that were happening, bringing all the stakeholders together during these meetings? And how do you see things kind of evolving to where there is sort of a structure starting to be in place to really implement some of the changes? Sure. Well, you know, one of the things that the department had to do is figure out a structure, you know, different bureaus, who's going to be handling what. And so, you know, child care is its own arena, um, services that fall under the banner of what would be called like early intervention. So um, home visiting. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the preschool programs, so like pre-K and Head Start. And they're all funded differently. They're all ran differently. So Head Start being a federal program, for example, and, and pre-K being state-run program. Um, and so there were, you know, the good news about all of this that happened is that we've known for years what the issues were. So there's, there's a fair amount of consensus on things that needed to happen. We know that there's not enough early childhood providers in general, not just in child care, but across the board. Um, and early childhood providers don't get paid living wages. And so those are, you know, those are things that people know pretty much across the board. We need to be able to recruit more people into the field so that, um, you know, so that students um, understand that early childhood is a viable career option and we need to pay them a living wage so that they can stay in the field. And, and really, you know, if we're going to communicate to, to the public that early childhood is important, which that message has gotten out, but, you know, that's why we're on the brink of this land grant amendment vote. Um, that message has gotten out, but the message that seems to be getting out slower is that we need to pay early childhood providers what they're worth, especially um, when we see the same kinds of shortages in early childhood that we see in K-12 education. So there has been um, efforts there to, you know, how do we how do we streamline bringing people into the field? How do we support them once they're there with professional development opportunities? Um, so workforce was obviously a huge area. Um, another area is just increasing access to early childhood services in general. We, we know that the return on investment for early childhood is huge, um, particularly in areas like pre-K, but also early intervention. You know, the, the return on investment is, it's a foregone conclusion at this point. People understand that. And so that is, that's an amazing thing because that's pretty well understood now in a, like across the board politically. So in a way that's really helpful for that not to be necessarily a political battle anymore. It's not, the battle isn't whether or not early childhood is important. It's understood that it is. Um, where the disagreements come into play is then what to focus on, where to focus dollars, what programs to focus on. Um, so another area is increasing access to early childhood education. Um, and then another big area is dealing with the inequities um, that we see in the state. So we see inequities in terms of who gets to access services, but also in a state like New Mexico that is rural and urban, we see a lot of um, the rural areas, um, the tribal areas that don't have access to early childhood services in the way that they should. And those services need to be delivered in a way that is culturally and linguistically relevant for the families receiving them. And so, um, you know, families shouldn't have to feel like they're making their kids kick their identities out the door when they send them to preschool in the morning or to school for that matter. So workforce, increased access across the board, and then issues relating to equity across the board, I think are some of the, the common areas that were discussed pretty in depth and have continued to be. Now you've been working on this issue for a while and working with stakeholders in our community in Las Cruces and across the state. Uh, you, you brought up equity and the challenges there. Do you think the conversations that are happening now are, are really um, paying attention to equity compared to maybe what was happening in years past? I do. Um, and I think New Mexico is in a really... Um, privileged place to be able to say that. This is, early childhood is one of those areas where New Mexico is actually ahead of the curve. Um, we have a, now a statewide department where a lot of states don't. Um, we're making investments where a lot of states haven't. So one example just this year is that um, in August, I wanna say, the state changed um, childcare subsidies. The eligibility criteria has been families at 200% of the poverty level 
or less were eligible for childcare subsidies. And the reality was that in most years past, it was families up to 150% of the poverty level who were really getting the services. And what the Early Childhood Education and Care Department did this year was they increased that subsidy um, eligibility from 200 to 350% of the federal poverty level. It's, it's almost unheard of. And so that means huge numbers of families who weren't eligible for child care assistance before are now eligible. Um, and so that was pretty groundbreaking. The other thing that the department did just recently, and, and New Mexico is the first state in the nation to be doing this, is they are, um, when families get those child care subsidies, the state reimburses the child care provider. And so there's a formula that's been used to determine how much that provider gets reimbursed per child if the family's eligible for the subsidy. But the problem has been all these years is that the, the child care provider doesn't get reimbursed what it actually costs to provide childcare. So those subsidy rates weren't based on the true cost of provided care. So at some point in the chain, someone ate that cost, either the childcare provider or the parents or both. And so what the Early Childhood Education and Care Department did this year, just in the last few months, is they changed the formula and it's now based on the true cost of providing care. So they're providing reimbursements now based on the true cost of providing childcare, which means there's not people down the line who have to, you know, underpaid, already underpaid childcare providers have to, don't have to eat that cost. And now parents don't have to eat that cost anymore either. So, um, you know, those are just two examples of some pretty huge things that have happened on a statewide basis and just this year. So what are some of those true costs of what it takes to provide childcare that, that you're talking about that are now included? Well, it's primarily person power, right? It's to take care of kids costs money and you have to be aware of ratios. So, you know, if you're taking care of young children, you have to have one adult per, you know, four. If it's infants, it's a, one adult to four. And if it's, I believe if it's above infant, so above three, um, it's one adult for every six kids. And so person power is a huge one. Um, the other is that to have a, a registered or licensed child care center, there are a lot of regulations. And so um, there's a lot of um, things you have to do to make sure that health and safety are accounted for. And then, you know, just taking care of kids all day, there's a lot of stuff that you need. There's the food, there's the cleaning supplies, there's, um, you know, changing diapers, there's making sure that kids have things to play with all day long, uh, making sure that there's enough for everyone. And so there's, there are a ton of things that have to go into a well-managed classroom, whether it's in someone's home or a center. Um, and childcare providers, you know, when they're going into the field, they're usually investing in those costs up front. It's not like there's typically been like a huge fund that people can tap into to help pay for some of the upfront costs of going into the childcare, um, you know, profession. I see. So in the midterm elections, New Mexico voters are going to have an opportunity to weigh in on a constitutional amendment that could really change the outcome of how early childhood education is funded and care in our state. Can you kind of share with us uh, what's going to be on the ballot and what's really at stake here? Sure. Well, this has been years in the making. Actually, it's been I think, over a decade now. And that been a push to take 1% of our land grant permanent fund and use it towards early childhood education. And so when voters go to the polls in November 2022, they will um, have the option to vote on this amendment. So it already passed in the legislature um, because the constitutional amend amendment, um, the legislature had to pass it first. Um, the governor didn't have to sign off on it because it's not a bill, but then it has to go to the voters. And so um, the, the essence of the amendment is, is essentially recognizing that education begins at birth and it would allocate about 125 million from the permanent fund every year to the early childhood education and care department. And what changed this year is that they added, when it finally passed, they added an element that would include K-12 as well. So now in addition to that 125 million, there would also be 75 million to the public education department for K-12 education. Okay, so obviously 
uh, I, we'll be talking to lawmakers um, ab about what they what they did pass, and that's going to be a big topic for voters uh, during the midterm elections. But I want to talk with you about uh, is that move uh, really enough? I know that New Mexico Voices for Children uh, this summer uh, spoke out saying that more funding is even needed because it really doesn't fully address uh, the issue of how many kids are dealing with poverty in New Mexico here, saying that it costs a lot more to help educate a child who is growing up in poverty than a child that has access to a lot of amenities. Can you kind of give us an understanding of why that is? Uh, sure. You know, one of the education isn't just about who shows up at the door. It's about everything that's happening in that child's life before they walk up to the door of any particular school or their child care provider. And so, you know, we have some of the highest um, food insecurity rates in the country, um, particularly with regards to child hunger or child food insecurity. And so, particularly with what we know about early childhood, we know that the, the brain develops at a tremendous rate during those first three years. And so if that child isn't getting everything that they're needing in terms of food, but also consistent care from their providers, um, safety, all of those things, then it impacts the brain development and it uh, in turn impacts their ability to learn. And so when we're talking about early childhood um, or childhood well-being in general, it's about increasing access to care. It's making sure that kids have responsive care, whether it's at home or in an educational setting, but it's also making sure that kids have their basic needs met. So food, um, housing, one of the things the pandemic unearthed was that, um, or made obvious to a point we can't ignore it anymore, is that um, broadband is not a luxury. Broadband is a necessity. And if families are cut off from broadband, they're cut off from what we need. And so, um, Families that live in poverty on, or, like, you know, chronically in poverty don't have access to a lot of those things. Um, and that impacts their, their child's ability to, to learn and develop optimally. So no, 125 million a year is not gonna take care of all of that. That's intended to address access to early childhood education programs specifically. Um, the state and our local communities and nationally, there, there needs to be a lot of efforts around child well-being holistically. Um, access to early childhood education is one way, it's one huge important way to, um, to deal with the effects of poverty, but it's not the only thing. I mean, there's so many things uh, happening here with um, early childhood education. I mean, with what we're seeing with this question that's going to be on the ballot for voters, I mean, what are things you think voters need to consider when they go into uh, that booth to um, check yes or no on that question? Uh, what's really at stake? What do what do uh, you know? What's the long term vision on this plan? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one thing for, you know, a question that voters would probably have, which is understandable, is how would if I vote yes on this, how does that impact me? You know, people want to know. In fact, most people probably don't know that the state has the land grant permanent fund, much less what it is. Um, and, you know, as a taxpayer most or a parent, most people want to know, is this going to affect my income? So what's important for people to know is that the state does have this land grant permanent education fund. It's one of the largest in the country. Um, and so what um, the fund grows at a huge rate. So when this campaign to pass the constitutional amendment started over 10 years ago, the fund had $10 billion in it. And today it has over $22 billion in it. So the fund's growing every year at a pretty consistent rate. I think it's 11% and so are around 11%. And what the proposal is to take 1% of that and allocate it towards early childhood education and care. And the reason that's important is because one of the, just one of the many reasons it's important is that people are seeing right now, I think all these, um, resources going into early childhood, um, which is long overdue. The challenge with a lot of those funds is that they're not occurring. So, you know, there's this federal relief money that's coming down, whether it's ARPA funds or, um, or otherwise CARES Act funds, and they're coming down, but they're one-time funds. And so we need, um, it helps in the short term, but what the state needs is recurring investments. 
Um, and what taxpayers tend to be concerned about is, you know, is this going to come out of my income also? So it's important for people to know that this is not something that amounts to essentially a tax increase for them. It comes out of the already existing land grant permanent fund, um, and it's it provides recurring funds every year. And that means that those funds continue to go into early childhood, regardless of who happens to be in political power. So when we change governors, when we change, when we have elections and legislators change, it's not something that can be changed on the whim of one person. So it's a concentrated strategic effort. Um, there's been a lot of thought and work put into this and advocacy for years and years and years. And when um, when there's polls done of New Mexicans, the polls show people are vast, are pretty overwhelmingly in favor of it. So um, I'm sure there will be more information about that coming in this coming year. You can anticipate there will be some pretty broad voter education efforts um, in the coming months. Um, yeah, it's obviously going to be a, a major uh, talked about issue. And uh, of course, we look forward to talking with uh, voters and lawmakers about it, about this issue. I I want to move on, though. And, you know, you talked about when you're talking about early childhood education, you're not just talking about, uh, you know, walking in the door to get educated. There's so much that goes into it. Um, with what we're seeing now, you mentioned the, the federal funding is there now, but it's not going to be there, um, you know, indefinitely. So what are some things that people should pay attention to or programs perhaps that we're seeing right now that really are amazing and that could have a chance if they're funded um, by state lawmakers or other folks here in, in our state, um, should they choose to do that? Is there anything that we're learning from the pandemic during this time with early childhood education? Well, probably a lot of things. Um, <laughs> that's a huge question. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, obviously people are making tough decisions and it's it's a challenging issue. You mentioned the challenge with the workforce and paying uh, wages that, that folks can survive on in this industry. Um, obviously there's turnover issues uh, with this with this industry as well. And so, I mean, what what's really happening that, what are some opportunities you think right now with early ch childhood education that state lawmakers should pay attention to because this could be a su successful, sustainable program or perhaps option? Sure. Um, well, whether at the state or the federal level, um, it's, you know, the age old thing and that's that there needs to be strategic targeted investments in early childhood. Um, one of the biggest issues we have is capacity. So that's not just the workforce, um, numbers of people. So we need to have a strategy for recruiting people into the early childhood workforce and retaining them. Um, but also um, say tomorrow the state allocated as much money as is needed for every child or every family that needed childcare to have it, we don't have enough facilities. <laughs> and so there's these capital, you know, investments that need to be made as well. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of room for, for our um, policymakers and our local leaders to be thinking about how that can be implemented in our state. Um, because for example, the answer isn't necessarily to go build a bunch of new buildings. Um, in a lot of states, they will look at um, already existing buildings, whether they're community centers, whether they're churches, and they'll enter into partnerships um, so that essentially everybody wins. You know, there's an already existing building that can be used. Whoever owns the building gets some income by whoever's renting it. And then whoever the child care provider is doesn't have to go figure out how to build a new building. And so there's some capacity, there's some pretty big capacity issues that um, we can think creatively about how to solve. Um, another thing to think about is that one of the areas that makes New Mexico unique in childcare is that we do allow home care providers, um, which is childcare providers that are providing care out of their homes instead of out of a center. And in New Mexico, um, that, that becomes unique, particularly in Doniana County, because the bulk of those registered home childcare providers are here in Southern New Mexico, and they're in Doniana County, particularly South County. And so these are, um, you know, these are largely women, again, largely underpaid, largely women of color 
and they are providing care in regions where, where there's typically a lack of access. So think about Chaparral and um, Sunlin and Vado and all the areas in South County we know about um, the colonias, the areas that are hard to reach, the areas that don't have services, that don't have infrastructure. Um, and these women are providing services, you know, they're taking care of kids out of their home and they are frequently under-resourced. And so prior to the pandemic, there had been very few resources um, sent their way. Um, so think about trying to run a childcare out of your home when you're the only provider, or maybe it's you and one other person, and um, you're getting reimbursed, but not at the true care of providing services. Um, you're out in a rural area, so there are other services aren't, to, aren't readily available. Um, you have to get permits and registrations and, and go through the entire process of making sure that your home is safe to take care of kids. And, um, and then you don't have the benefit of um, health insurance or um, you know, a substitute teacher if you get sick or you know, any of those just normal things people need to be able to work and to live. So there are, I think, really targeted investments we need to make in, into these kinds of resources. We have, we have the people already doing the work, um, but we can't not support them and then wonder why they disappear. You know? So that's a huge investment to invest in. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time uh, for this discussion, but we look forward to talking with you in the future. Lori Martinez is Executive Director of Engage New Mexico. Thank you so much for joining us for the program. Thanks for having me. And we want to thank you for joining us for another episode of Fronteras at Changing America. I'm Anthony Marnol. We'll see you next time.